Welcome to our worship this morning, continuing on through our Pentecost season in the Lord Jesus Christ and his growth and work among us. The 13th Sunday after Pentecost is our service uh, date today, and the order service is both in our worship folder as well as our PowerPoint. Let us join our voices together for our first hymn, Renew Me, O Eternal Light, and let us rise.
Father, give to us, we pray, the help needed to grow in faith, hope, and love. And make us love what you want, so that we may receive what you promise. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It pleases me to read from the Old Testament this morning, Isaiah chapter 51, 1 through 6. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like, the sm like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Find the epistle in Romans 12, 1 through 9. St. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all our members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise to sing the Alleluia for For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
May God fill you all with great hope and joy and peace in your believing. Amen. Our message today for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. The account of Jesus asking who he is and the wonderful confession of faith Peter gives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We learn at an early age, the world can be full of bullies. Bullying is an easy way to forcibly grab power. Bullying can even look attractive, seem strong. But it's not. It's very weak, ego-driven, insecure, always based in fear. My parents had interesting advice for me if I encountered bullies at school. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Make a fist and plow them right in the face. <laughs> True. Proper advocacy, though, against bullying is crucial and is healthy in any place, any environment. And the church is certainly no place for that either. Satan is a bully. He's arrogant, evil, nasty, and chained up to hell. His fate is sealed. Jesus shed blood, sweeps Satan into the eternal abyss, while at the same time Jesus' blood sweeps us all into heaven. And we can face Satan toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the faith-filled confidence of Jesus. The subject of Satan and hell makes many uncomfortable. But it need not. Hell, and here in the Greek they say Hades, was understood as the land of the dead, a temporary place awaiting the lake of fire that burns it all up on the last day. Satan's fate is eternal death and destruction. And that makes his threats that seem harmful, but are very empty. Like a bully, he can only draw power from the fear he tries to create. So while Jesus walks the earth, Satan is still looking to thwart God's plans. Jesus doesn't ask his disciples identity questions for no reason. He's well aware of his widespread yet misunderstood reputation. He's walking around an area that's a Roman town in northern Israel, right on that Syrian border. And there are many religions in that area. Fourteen different temples at that time honoring fourteen different gods dotted the map. Even Israel's King Herod the Great had finished building a large temple for the Romans to use to worship Caesar. Nearby, a large rock cliff were hundreds and hundreds of feet high, and underneath a cavern called the Gates of Hades, a sacred yet fearful place. At this location is the rock where Jesus <coughs> calls Simon Petrus, Peter. Now, don't think rock as in huge rock like Christ. Think small stone, garden rock, maybe even a pebble. On this rock, means Jesus takes a hold of Peter, picks him up as he would a child, and sits him down onto himself, for Christ is the rock. He is the rock of our foundation. And on the rock of Christ, not Peter, the future church is built. It's no letdown. With Peter, because of the faith we have by Christ, we enjoy the same wonderful heritage of faith and life on that rock. We are all stones, you might say, built upon the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ. The church will rest on Christ and be safe in the midst of evil and all different kinds of beliefs. And it's no wonder Jesus asks, who do the people say that I am? Now we've heard John the Baptizer and Elijah, other prophets, maybe Jeremiah, because Jesus walked around and preached and taught, did miracles, looked like what they were remembering prophets to be. Okay, but who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This title is like the Old Testament Messiah. Now we think of Messiah, especially around the time of Advent and Christmas, as Savior of the nations, our Redeemer. But for them, it still held a lot of strong political identity. The Jewish Messiah is a warrior like the great King David. And he will lead a religious army to defeat Rome, so something. And Peter, as you know, will act like a soldier in the Messiah's army when that night he pulls a sword out when Jesus is arrested before his crucifixion. 
And this time here is a critical gospel journey juncture, at a crossroads, you might say. As there are just 12 people among many different people and things and that towering landscape, Peter speaks this faithful sentence to Jesus that becomes our own solid confession of faith through the many centuries that have gone on since. And only the Father can make this so. This is faith in words. Because we know and believe what the Messiah has done. Peter's living in that strange feeling between knowing the answer to Jesus' question and waiting to see the outcome of that question. To not only understand but believe and proclaim that the war this Messiah fights will only bring about his death, not ours. And in that death, all of us can live a new life. Now, a lot of religious assumptions swirl around in our heads about Jesus. We could spend the rest of the time asking who each of us think Jesus is or how he relates to us or the church. When we're sad, we want him drying our tears and giving us a way out. When we're desperate, we demand instant rescue. Or we get a bad attitude and we're entitled and we think God should never have allowed anything bad to happen in the first place. As if our faith, like a warrior shield or a bulletproof vest, protects us somehow, making us free from harm. It's easy crafting Jesus into a nice little trophy, as if we earned it. And he better do what we expect. This is why God lets us walk close to the edge of life or suffer have a few battle scars to remind us that he is in control and that he has our backs and he will draw us back to himself because the ending is already written in Jesus' blood. One aspect of a worship life in the church that is so good is that we are divinely tapped on the shoulder and reminded, yes, I am your God, I love you and I dwell with you. Our Lord Jesus is right here. He is in the words, the music, the thoughts, the hearts, the conversations, the water the bread, the wine. People get lost when they begin thinking God is just out there somewhere, far away, not too concerned except making our life hard. It's easy to be an unbeliever when you forget God has come to live in you in faith. When he's a negative bad guy boss sitting up high on a golden throne, he represents every nasty overlord or boss we could ever dream of. And Satan likes that too. Then he has you believing his lies. Because discipleship is a lifelong journey of falling down and God picking you back up. Because Jesus promises as his living body in the everyday world, nothing can stop you. The Holy Spirit keeps winging you into safety and hope. Really, what can harm you? Satan? No. The gates of hell shall not prevail against you, our scripture says. Hell's entry is no defense against believers in Christ. Jesus blows those gates right off their hinges the moment he rises from the dead and goes down and proclaims to them in word and glorious bodily example, I win. I'm alive. Every man, woman, child, person, animal, soil, flower, river, all win. Death loses. The war is over. Yet the spiritual battle rages on. Hell's gates will not withhold followers of Jesus beating against them. Hell's gates are broken down like rusty, dry, rotted, and indefensible doors. That's what prevail means here. It's actually a Greek military term that your enemy, the general, will see and he can notice they're not strong enough to overpower you because your army will easily take them down. And that means for us, Hell can't withstand nor prevail against any amazing grace of Jesus' gospel message. And you and I, as his body in the world, the church, will remain strong. He is the beginning and the start of the skirmish of battle. Jesus is getting close to that time. The Calvary is the end, and the hill he chooses to die on. His cross is his weapon. The nails, the crown of thorns, the spear, these make up his arsenal. He suffers, he hurts, he bleeds, he absorbs all the Hades that we escape, and then the threat of death is destroyed. Jesus overcomes evil with good and makes all things new. The land of the dead it is powerless. The devil's dominion over the world is gone, and our Lord still moves people in here by the gospel, gathers us all with the Spirit around Scripture and songs and hymns and forgiveness. And all of this draws us then back out into the world, 
where we are Jesus' hands and feet and mouths and eyes and ears and hearts. Isolation from spiritual gathering is only unhealthy. Gathering us in is good for all of us, like the bricks in a home, interconnected and locked together on the rock foundation of Christ. And we remain strong, an unbeatable family, thriving on grace, radiating out the compassion we receive, and advocating for those in need of help, speaking up to bullies, protecting the lost or the struggling, supporting each one of the stones together so we remain strong and intact, looking after one another and looking only to the rock upon which we live. And there we remain safe, for Christ is still the Son of the living God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond our human understanding, guard your hearts and lives in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing our offering song, Let the Vineyards Be Fruitful. <laughs> Hear us, O oh God. Hear us. 
peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you.
fed your children with the true man, the living bread from heaven. Give unto us, we humbly pray you, that the body and blood of your Son may be our support throughout our earthly pilgrimage, until we reach that land where there is neither hunger nor thirst, your magnificent heavenly banquet, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and rules with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close with our last song. We, the Spirit sent us forth to serve.